Hello, it's great that you could join me in my study. This week I've been pursuing a number of projects. I was able to finish my article on divine pardon and forgiveness. It turned out to be much too long, however. It's over 20,000 words, and so now the project is to cut it down to the 8,000 word limit. The other thing that I've been doing this week is preparing for a conference this month at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the Chicago area on creation out of nothing. I've been asked to address the topic from a scientific point of view to speak about creation out of nothing and contemporary science, and I'll be arguing in my paper that the belief that God brought the universe into being a finite time ago without any sort of antecedent or contemporaneous material cause is fully in accord with modern science. And I'll have two commentators, the Old Testament scholar Jack Collins and then the process theologian Thomas Ord, and I'll then be given a chance to reply to them. The third thing that I've been involved in this week is reading this book, which is Jacob Milgram's second uh, volume of his Leviticus commentary. I wanted to see what Milgram had to say about a Leviticus 7.11, which is a key atonement verse. Here is his translation of that verse. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have assigned it to you on the altar to ransom your lives, for it is the blood that ransom by means of the life. What's interesting about Milgram's commentary is that he thinks that the blood of the sacrifice does indeed atone for sin, that it expiates the sin and the guilt of the offerer. But he does not think that this verse applies to the sacrifices described earlier in the book of Leviticus. This is because he thinks that the 17th chapter comes from a different source than the earlier chapters. And so he says that this verse only has to do with the peace offering, which is not an expiatory sacrifice in the earlier part of Leviticus. Oddly enough also, uh, Milgram thinks that this uh, sacrifice is not offered as a substitute uh, to God for the worshiper. The death of the sacrifice does not represent the worshiper's death. However, his argument against substitution is very odd. He says, if this were a substitutionary offering, then why wouldn't the priest offer the sacrifice rather than the worshiper himself? To my mind, this implies exactly the opposite conclusion. The fact that it is the worshiper himself who must make the sacrifice of his own animal rather than assigning this to a priest to do is symbolic of the substitution of the sacrifice for the worshiper himself. Though the worshiper deserves death for his sin, the sacrifice um, is slaughtered in, in his place. And therefore, having the worshiper do this himself seems very appropriate. Also, Milgram ignores in this part of the commentary the hand-laying ceremony that we talked about earlier in this series where the worshiper presses his hand upon the head of the animal uh, before sacrificing it, indicating, I think, his symbolic identification with the animal that he's about to offer in sacrifice. Milgram admits that his uh, view of this key verse is idiosyncratic and rejected by the majority of Old Testament scholars today. Uh, and so while his view is interesting, I do not think that it serves to undercut the notion of a substitutionary, uh, sacrificial, uh, expiatory offering for sin and guilt.